Hello. Welcome. Should we, should we start? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Thanks for coming out today. Um, uh, we're going to talk about food, one of my favorite topics. Uh, I'm Bob Fung. I'm the uh, director and the founder of Civenergy, and we're co-sponsoring this forum with uh, Davis Media Access. Uh, the director of Davis Media Access is Autumn, sitting over here, and they're helping us to record the video today, which will be made public on the internet. So if you have friends who, haven't, uh, who, who weren't able to make it to the forum, then you could point them at the video. Um, let's see, uh, Civenergy uh, has two missions. One is uh, uh, pretty focused. We put on uh, voter forums uh, during election season. We put on a, um, uh, forum uh, for the Davis City Council election in 2018 at the Davis uh, Community Church. And uh, we had a, a little bit of a food theme going. Uh, we had food uh, after uh, the forum, which is a bit unusual. And uh, Anne, who was the moderator, asked two food questions. So uh, we, we, we are on the food theme. Uh, the second, the second uh, um, uh, mission of, of Civenergy is civic engagement, to increase the civic energy of citizens uh, locally here in Davis. Uh, and um, when we heard about this uh, uh, a possible forum, we, we said immediately that we would support it. So uh, we think that food is an important part of the social fabric of any society, and we think it's important to discuss it. Um, Davis Media Access, uh, I just have a little, Autumn likes it, me to read a little thing. Uh, well, <laughs> anyways, uh, they, they're, uh, they're a media company that uh, 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 supports local non-commercial media, allows independent uh, uh, programs to to um, to be d uh, produced and uh, shown in Davis. Um, um, let's see. Um, we want to th uh, we want to say that uh, I want to say that um, we did not we did not pr uh, sort of organize this. Uh, uh, forum. We, we're not providing any content. of Energy and Davis Media Access, the four conveners of the Let's Talk About Food, that's Ann, uh, Dima, Catherine, and Grace, have provided all, will provide all the content uh, for the forum. And we want to thank uh, Diane Paro, who's sitting over here in the city of Davis, for helping us to organize the forum. So um, uh, Ann Evans is going to be the moderator. Uh, she's the former mayor of Davis. She uh, is the uh, uh, co-founder of the Davis Co-op and the Davis uh, Farmer's Market, and she's author of the Davis, Davis Farmer's Market cookbook. Ann? Okay. Thank you, Bob. So, great. It's like 7.10. That's official start time in Davis, right? So we can, we can get going. We're here to talk about food. And here to really kick us off uh, is our mayor, Brett Lee. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and having a chance to listen to Brett and listen to really the contents of this report. Um, it's really appropriate that Brett kick this off. Uh, Dima and Catherine and I, for the last two years or so, we're talking about whether or not Davis ought to have a food policy council. And we went round and round and, and really argued with one another about the role of it, the, the efficiency, the effectiveness. And about eight months ago, we finally just decided, yes, it's probably, you know, it's probably what we need to get some of the initiatives that we were interested in, food and agriculture, uh, waste reduction, going in Davis. So we wrote some thoughts up on it, and we approached our fairly newly elected mayor, Brett Lee, uh, with the thought of 
Going forward with a mayoral initiative around the, th the themes that you'll hear discussed tonight in food. And Brett immediately embraced it, saw the importance, the both macro and the micro scale of it, and he took it to his city council colleagues who also unanimously supported and had been talking about it and supported this concept. So with that, we were able to work with Diane Perro, uh, which was very significant in helping us shape the steps that followed. And we'll go over those in a little bit. But I wanted to bring Brett up here and thank him for introducing the initiative and ask him to say a few words. So Brett. Uh, thank you, Anne, and uh, thank you for saying everything that I was uh, about to say. <laughs> I was going to give the little bit of a history of meeting with Anne and uh, Catherine and Dima, and uh, so uh, sometimes uh, repetition is helpful for you to remember things. Uh, I, I think you get the general uh, idea on this, though. But there are a couple of key points that I, I really want to make sure you're aware of. The city of Davis when I say the city of Davis, the community of Davis is what it is today because of people who have stepped forward to bring their knowledge and ideas forward and find like-minded other folks who are willing to work together to help sort of push those forward. And when uh, Anne came forward and you know, emailed me and I th kind of read what uh, you know, Catherine and Dima had been working on, it's like, wow, this, this is wonderful. This is a, a great opportunity because Davis is really in the right spot to talk about how we distribute food, how we grow food, you know, this whole changing way of how we view food, its production, its distribution, and its use. And when I say use, that's probably a, a cold way of saying, you know, how we, you know, like to enjoy our food in terms of eating it, right? And so I feel very fortunate to have this opportunity um, as sort of a new mayor to be able to help nudge this forward a little bit or perhaps open a door or two to help this gain some momentum and actually come to fruition. I can't do it without my colleagues, and so I, I did bring it very early on to my council colleagues to make sure that we were all, all, all on board and all felt a piece of ownership of this because the ideas that you'll hear about tonight will need some city council support. And so we want to not get too far away from what's happening here because we want to step in at the right time and provide that city support. And um, before I go too far, I just want to thank city staff for helping this event happen and also Davis Media Access and Civ Energy. Uh, actually, Civ Energy and Davis Media Access are examples of those ideas of people stepping forward, hey, I have this good idea, and actually willing to do some work to make it happen. Uh, my apologies to Cool Davis if, uh, if my, my guess is you'll be quite happy with this comparison, and my guess is uh, the food policy group will be quite happy with this comparison as well, but I, I haven't pre-checked it out with them. My guess is that this group that you see before you and in the room will create something very similar to Cool Davis. And Cool Davis is an essential partner, and actually much more than a partner. They really take the lead on the city's climate action plan, ideas for how are we going to be a sustainable community when it comes to climate change, greenhouse gas issues, things of that nature. They, they are much more than a partner, but it is this idea, people stepping forward, coming together, moving things forward. And I imagine that this group, especially as you hear some of their proposals, will be, fill a similar role in this uh, food and ag space. Uh, and just sort of in closing with my opening remarks, I just want to thank you for coming out and let you know that myself and my council colleagues are very supportive of this effort. And that's important because um, I, I think it's important that people know when you're putting in those hours, that time, that you do have the institutional support behind you because we actually want to see results. And we're so thankful that Anne and team are going to make it so easy for us to have those results. But thank you. Great. Thank you, Brett. Thank you very, very much. So what are we going to do tonight? We have a process outlined for the next 45 minutes or so. You all have 
green cards, three by five cards, we, you handed those? Okay, so you know at any time, write a question, you'll hand those in, we'll ask those for the second half. But the first half, um, we're going to go over sort of how we came about uh, doing the report. You're gonna hear a summary of each of the four sections of the report. You're gonna hear an expert react, an expert sort of talk with you about, well, I think it's missing this. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that, uh, don't forget this. And then we have three, uh, and I'll introduce the dais in a minute, three sort of super audience reactors who are gonna take a minute each or so and um, kind of give their thought on it. What, just how, how, do, how are they feeling about it? Each of them have a background in, in food, sustainability and agriculture as well. So that's the format. And I want to introduce then um, Dima Tamimi, who you've heard her name. She's the founder of Land and Ladle Nonprofit and Giving Garden, and really is responsible for all these beautiful graphics and layout that you see, expert marketer. Catherine Brinkley, who's the assistant professor in the College of Ag and Environmental Science at UC Davis, um, Department of Human Ecology, and brought a lot of, uh, as everyone did, but a lot of the content to it. And then um, the experts, uh, you have Bapu Vaitla, is that how you say Vaitla? Thank you. Um, who's, he's a fellow at the UN Foundation, a researcher at Harvard School of Public Health, and visiting lecturer here at UC Davis on the politics of food systems. And he's worked on food security and nutrition policy programming for the last 15 years. Jo Joy Cohen is the director of philanthropic engagement for the Yolo Food Bank. Now Bapu is going to be the expert on sustainability. Joy is going to address the section on security and access, the section on innovation and entrepreneurship. Andy Water, Andrew Waterhouse, uh, will address. He's a professor at UC Davis and the director of the Robert Mondavi Institute. And branding and narrative is the fourth section. Lauren Kaliski will address that. He's the chief bread officer for Upper Crust Baking Company. They have a new location if you haven't seen it next to the co-op. Um, and he's on the board of directors also of Visit YOLO. Uh, for our reaction panel, we have Dan Kennedy. He's on the board of the Davis Farmers Market. And you may have read his monthly columns in the Davis Enterprise uh, on food that is grown locally and uh, from sort of a consumer point of view. I guess you just recently wrote about water, right? Um, Desmond Jolly is the retired director of the University of California's statewide small farm program and director of the Small Farm Center. Uh, Katrina Ullman is the director of the UC Davis Student Farm. And so that is our group on the dais that are gonna take us through the next 45 minutes. I wanna also introduce somebody extremely important to the process and to providing a lot of the content, and that's Grace Perry, who's a graduate student in community development at UC Davis. And so she interned with the project. And with that, uh, thanks to all the panel members, and I will turn it over to Dima and Catherine who are gonna start us off at the beginning of each section and give us a summary. Okay, um, so to start with, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the process, but before I, um, in terms of getting this to happen, uh, before I do that, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here. Um, I moved here about five years ago and the enthusiasm um, about food and how food can be a central piece for the city and for economic development has definitely been on the rise. So um, one thing I wanted to know is this is just the very beginning of the process. This is a draft report. Um, we definitely want your feedback and we also would love for anybody who wants to be involved to sign up on the website that we have at the bottom of all the slides coming up um, so that um, if you are interested in being involved, we can reach out to you. So in terms of the process, um, as Anne mentioned, we met with Brett Lee, and then after that, we had a great meeting with Diane Paro to figure out sort of who are the groups of people we needed to bring together to start drafting the first draft of this report and recommendation to the city on food and economic development. And in that meeting, um, we really wanted to make sure that we had representatives from a variety of groups. We wanted to have a students there. We wanted to have people from the farming community, businesses, um, advocacy groups, restaurant owners, academics. And um, so that was a big part of how we ended up figuring out who was going to come to uh, three key meetings that we put on in November and December. The first meeting that we had um, was actually very much focused on us figuring out as a group 
what were all the assets that Davis already has when we have so many amazing assets when it comes to food and agriculture. So we wanted to make sure that we compiled that list. Um, and what came out of that meeting, what was interesting is we also ended up seeing that there was already very key opportunities that had risen up and we could see that there were sort of trends and buckets of opportunities. So by the second meeting, um, and actually just to note, on that first discussion, that was actually opened by Mayor Bretley, um, and we also had council member Lucas Frerichs uh, and county supervisor Don Saylor there to open up the meeting, which was very helpful. Um, by the second meeting, we had already kind of figured out that there were these very key opportunity areas that had risen to the top. So during that meeting, we focused on opportunities, um, and we actually dove a little bit deeper in that. We broke out into, into areas where we could focus and then put actual action steps for each of the key areas that rose to the top. And those key areas actually ended up sticking, and those are the key areas that ended up in the report and that we're going to be actually talking about today. Um, at that meeting, that second meeting, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Gloria Partita opened up that meeting, and also Randy McNear uh, provided some comments at the beginning, and she's from the Davis Farmers Market. Also, Andrea Lepore, who is the owner of um, Solomon's Delicatessen, she's a local food entrepreneur, uh, gave us a really amazing presentation and an inspiring story about what she's trying to build in Sacramento. It's a food incubator and kitchen space called Food Factory, which allowed us to sort of broaden our minds around what opportunities are available in Davis. Um, by the third discussion, uh, we had already at that point with two surveys come down to these four action areas. We agreed on those four action areas and then that, that third discussion was really about feasibility and how do we actually move forward. Diane Paro spoke at that meeting. We also had Dan Carson there, council mem member Dan Carson. Um, and then lastly, we had Ken Hyatt, who's from the city of Woodland talk about the Woodland Food Front campaign, um, which is a campaign really focused on economic, economic development around food um, and, a, and also a branding campaign. So that was um, really good for us to see sort of locally a city taking on food as an economic driver. Um, and then the last sort of event that we had was actually in partnership with the um, Davis Futures Forum. And for that event, we really wanted to bring an outside speaker with an outside perspective. So we brought in Paula Daniels, who is actually the founder of the LA Food Policy Council. And she brought a really interesting perspective around the policy changes around street food vending that they had successfully done in LA, as well as their good food purchasing practices. So all of the, um, the content from those four events was compiled. Grace was amazing in bringing all that together. and then. Together, we, we brought that together into a report, and we had now these four key action areas which we're going to go through. Uh, but before we jump into the action areas, Catherine has some additional comments on the process. Sorry, being a faculty in community development, process is all important to the product. And um, there have been over 340 uh, food policy councils in North America since 2018. So we had a lot of... Um, a lot of case studies to learn from. In addition, we had, I'm, I'm lucky enough to work with Dave Campbell and Gail Feenstra, and they just published a report on California Food Policy Councils and, and how, to do, how to do them the right way. So we had a lot of guidance in figuring out the process and thinking deeply about building on Davis's strengths as opposed to um, bringing to light any weaknesses Davis may have. <laughs> um, so with that, um, we will now go into each of the priority action areas and kind of review uh, the report for you. And the report is available online. Do you want me to do this part? OK. All right. All right. I'm ready. All right. So the first priority action area is establishing Davis as a sustainable food testing lab leading in climate smart food practices. And Dima and I both have the pleasure of serving on the Downtown Planning Advisory Committee. So this is a theme that has come up earlier in, in thinking about the downtown plan, thinking about what to do with Davis, um, thinking about how to redevelop the downtown. And it was a theme that emerged again in our, in our um, community conversations. So, here, sustainable can be defined in many different ways. Um, we're using the definition um, that um, we're responsibly using resources so that there's enough for future generations. Um, and with that, uh, this uh, section really focuses on 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which is the focus of the Climate Action Plan, um, as well as food waste. So um, if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions. That's pretty shocking. It's uh, the largest single source of waste in California. Um, and this is a, a, a major um, uh, area that has potential to not only decrease greenhouse gas emissions, but also a lot of food waste streams, uh, food can be repurposed. So we had the benefit of having students from the Food Recovery Network on campus who brought a lot of their know-how from collecting from the farmer's market, collecting from the many grocery stores, and delivering it to the food bank. Um, and, and food cupboards, so there's a, there's a lot that can be done in Davis to augment this work, which would keep food from going into the landfill and would also help um, serve those who, are, who, who uh, lack um, food access. Um, so you will, you will start to see that even though there are four priority action areas, they are interwoven um, in many cases. So some of the, uh, the specific action steps for this action area include um, updating food waste ordinances, um, updating uh, food elements in uh, revisions of the Climate Action Plan, which is due for a revision, adopting zero food waste goals, um, focusing on uh, institutional programming, which can be uh, through the city, can be in partnership with the county, it can be in partnership with the school district, um, and, uh, and encouraging uh, public outreach. So many people don't know that they can easily donate. There's Good Samaritan laws, so cr creating um, outreach to help foster that. And then there are some other um, action areas which which deal with encouraging edible landscapes and gleaning, which is collecting food um, that, that hasn't been harvested uh, the first go around. And these recommendations excitingly mirror a lot of the recommendations that the downtown plan has and might find their way into the general plan for Davis as well. So you, you'll start to see some synergies with the proposal that's in this report as well as many of the other um, planning action agendas around the city. And with that, I will hand it over to Dima for the... So actually, Anne, this is when we will bring the experts to have a reaction. <laughs> so, all right, Bapoot, so your turn just to rea you know, mm -hmm. tell us what you think and what else we need to be doing here to really go deeper. So first, I want to commend you for all of your work, everyone who's involved. I know it's a lot of, a lot of effort to convene people and, and sift through the literature and case studies. And I really think you've hit the high points as far as sustainability is concerned. So, so uh, thank you for all of your work. As far as my observations on this, I want to make three broad points that I hope will be useful. Uh, the first has to do with your language here about um, Car being carbon neutral as a goal in sustainability. I think that's a, it's a great choice if you're gonna um, have a vision for and kind of an overall guiding principle for sustainability. And uh, the next step there is I think to develop metrics around that goal that will help you to evaluate how different interventions, the trade-offs between different interventions, sort of the costs, the feasibility of them, both logistically and politically, as compared to reductions in emissions or CO2. Uh, and the reason why I think carbon food system accounting is a good overarching uh, framework for metrics is because uh, it turns out that, that food waste, reducing food waste and converting to more plant-based diets are two of the most powerful ways to reduce CO2 of any intervention, of any change in any sector. Uh, they're very, very strong ways to draw down CO2. Uh, you've directly addressed the food waste issue in some of these action steps, and you've also emphasized food education. And one of the other recommendations that I'll make is the linkage between food education and plant-based diets. But uh, I, I think there's an implication there in food education that conversion of diets to a more sustainable model is also uh, core to your overall vision. So what I think would be great to see is somewhere over the next six to nine months, 
Um, and I know Cool Davis has probably done some of this carbon accounting. I know that there are professors at the university in the environmental science and policy and urban and regional planning departments who are very focused on this kind of carbon system accounting. To take a look at the different action steps you have here and especially the priorities you have for 2019 and 2020, which are at the back of this document, and uh, get a sense of what are the costs and benefits associated with those in, in terms of practical dollars and cents and in terms of CO2. And, and there, I think you have a kind of information base by which to say, okay, given the, the political and logistical feasibility and the cost benefit calculations, this is where we're gonna put this amount of energy into driving forward. So I think that kind of formal carbon accounting would be, would be very useful. The, the second recommendation or observation that I want to make is around uh, the way that you framed the action steps around food waste, which I think is great. And again, I think you've hit some of the uh, main, uh, the high points as far as best practices in cities and towns and countries worldwide, so that's great. Uh, what I think would be great to layer on top of this as well is to think about some of these steps are about prevention uh, others are about diversion to places like the food bank that can meaningfully use them. Uh, and others are about uh, recycling uh, to use as energy or, or in the form of compost. The, the order in which I laid those things out are, I think, the orders in which you would ideally uh, deal with food waste. So prevention, I think, is the best uh, overarching strategy and then followed by mm -hmm. diversion and then followed by uh, recycling in some sense. So that kind of triage, that kind of uh, prioritization, it would be great to see that reflected in the decision-making process that happens over the next year. Um, and I also think when you're, when you're talking about um, food, reducing food waste generally, just to sort of emphasize the point that prevention is, is uh, perhaps the preferred way to, to start, is to think about um, the supply chain of food that's entering Davis. Uh, right now, restaurants have their own mechanisms for assessing the efficiency of their, of their supply chain. And I think there's probably a lot of sharing of best practices that could happen between the restaurants themselves that could be facilitated by the city. Uh, which is a probably low-cost endeavor to say, okay, well, what's working actually to prevent overstocking of materials? How can we cut down on the supply end to make sure that uh, the, the input of carbon, of food entering the city, being generated in the city, is as efficient as possible? So that kind of sharing of best practices of supply chain management is what I would love to see. Looks like I have a minute to go, so I'll uh, close just with the food education part. And again, I really like your priorities. I would emphasize that um, a conversion to plant-based diets is really the strongest evidence-based link that we have between um, food system change and environmental sustainability. So I, I understand that uh, we don't want to restrict choice, and um, I'm not a vegetarian myself, or I'm a bad vegetarian, I'm so bad that I can't really call myself one. But I, I will have to admit that the, the evidence is kind of overwhelming that plant-based diets have a profound, profound impact on food system sustainability. So when you think about education, when you think about these action steps, I would really think deeply about uh, kind of a non-intrusive way and an educational way to, to, to show citizens here, to show restaurants the benefits of uh, plant-based diets, and then I would just tie that one last time to your other action priority areas. You know, clearly that's an issue of healthy diets, but it might also feed into your branding and also into your food entrepreneurship is to kind of define Davis as a place where it's not just great restaurants, but also there's this food sustainability, plant-based diet uh, angle to it as well. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you very, very much. And so I'm just going to turn over to our reactors. Um, and whoever would like to start first, go ahead. Just any, any thoughts? Um, Desmond? Yeah, I'd just like to observe that a lot of food waste occurs at the level of the farm. This proposal seems to fun um, point the finger to food waste at the level of consumption. Um, restaurants, other kind of food institutions. But uh, if, if, the, if the objective is to reduce food waste 
overall in the food system to impact climate change, then you have to work with people who deliver information to farmers. As to, and there's a lot of uncertainty around farming that have to do with the varieties they plant, how they anticipate markets, um, the quality they think they can take to market, and what do you do with the, the culls, the part you don't take to market. So it's not just at the level of the consumption sites, either the household or the restaurants or the hospital, but it's also at the level of the farm, and that's a huge one. Okay, thank you. Katrina? Um, I just I wanted to echo what Bapu said earlier and just commend this whole group for pulling this together. Um, I, I was really excited to see food waste addressed and also um, uh, some of the emphasis on food recovery and um, uh, especially this idea of reducing policy barriers for food sharing. I know there's a number of people within the community that are really interested in that, um, and there's uh, a lot of potential benefits to that. I also was really happy to see grants um, uh, identified um, as a, a source of funding to promote some of this work. And um, I, I echo the sentiments around um, education. I think that Babu's point about um, uh, emphasizing plant-based diets is is a nice one, but I think it'd be important to think about how to talk about that. <laughs> um, and the last thing I just want to say is that um, I was really excited to see the emphasis on supporting local and sustainable foods. And um, I think that from talking with some farmers, I think there are some challenges for farmers to get into restaurants in the areas, and I know some at least are interested in food hubs, so it might be nice to include something like that in there. And I probably went over a minute. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Dan. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I'd like to take a broader look at all of this, includes this and, and more, which is how high can you go? We're talking about this initiative, so have many other cities around the country and states, and what's possible in Davis? I told Ann earlier, I, this is the sort of document I'd expect from a city of two million people. I mean, the, the inclusions, the, the ideas, and so forth. But on the other hand, we're a small town. What gives us credentials at a high level is three things. The university with its ag programs and wine programs. The farmer's market that by anybody's market is, marker is one of the best in the whole country and the region. I spoke to Michael Pollan after he uh, came out with his book, and I said, what's the best region in the country? He was not gonna go on the record with it, but he said, you got it, and he said New York would be best uh, in the second place after that. So that's what we have to work with, which I throw that out there because how high can we go when we set visions, and we ought to set visions that are pretty darn high. Great, thank you. Good, well, I think we're ready to move to action uh, priority number two. So priority number two is ensuring a healthy diet for all. And this, um, to speak to Dan's point, is a high, high vision. And um, it builds from a, and with a, a really bold initiative with the, the YOLO Food Bank, which is to end hunger in the county. So. We often think of Davis as a very affluent city, and, and by many markers it is, but it's also the most food insecure city in the county. Um, and a large portion of the food insecure are, are students. So about 44% of students at UC Davis are food insecure. And this should be shocking because UC Davis is the number one agricultural university in the country. So students can't perform well when they, when they can't eat. Um, and there are choices that need to be made. But there's also um, food insecure people who live in Davis who are not students. And so this, this, um, this section of the, the report really seeks to weave together a lot of the economic development efforts to lift up the folks who, um, who, who aren't being lifted up and who, um, who struggle with um, uh, federal initiatives that are continuously being removed. Um, so you'll, you'll notice in the report that we mention something incredibly bold. Um, we, we take it from Belo Horizonte, Brazil, which is a city that 
uh, decided in the 1990s it was going to have a zero hunger policy. They dedicated 2% of the city budget to ending hunger. Um, they used that budget to, um, for public procurement programs supporting local farmers. Um, and uh, the, that food was delivered to public cafeterias where anyone can eat. Um, you, can, you can provide a donation, but anyone can eat there. Um, the majority of the customers who eat there are low income or homeless. Um, so this is an idea that, that Davis could take on. It's a big, bold idea that would make a big, bold statement. Um, and it's one for which we have a, a lot of um, partners who are already working in this area. Um, so this, the specific action areas for, for this section um, really require deeper thought. And so one of the big action areas is creating a council or a committee who can think about how such an effort might be funded. Um, how uh, that effort could uh, be woven together with federal, state, local funding, uh, grant funding, um, and, um, and, and thinking about some of the newer models. So again, we had Paula Daniels, who's a, a leading expert in food policy with LA, um, who's founded um, Good Food uh, LA and is also helping cities with public procurement. Davis would have the potential to be the sixth city on the list that has a Good Food uh, public procurement um, uh, um, stamp on it. Um, and then we also, in our research, uh, uncovered um, many public kitchens that Davis already has. So six public kitchens in the city of Davis. Those are spaces that entrepreneurs could use, but they're also spaces that might be um, uh, able to be opened up so that lower cost food could, um, could, could be released in, in, into the city. Um, so uh, the, the next items here are exploring more grant opportunities for food rescue, for food access, for entrepreneurs, small scale entrepreneurs, and building food capacity um, in that sense. Um, We've already mentioned that UC Davis is working in this space. The county, uh, Don Saylor, is working um, on, on food access issues. And so there are partnerships um, that can be uh, had there for optimizing gleaning programs, for food recovery logistics. And then uh, one of the last uh, bullets is supporting low-cost, healthy food options. And this um, I won't talk about right now, but it spills over into legalizing street food vending for the city of Davis, um, but also builds upon the public kitchens that the city has that could be utilized for entrepreneurial space and also uh, lower cost healthy food for food insecure. Great. Okay. Thank you. So Joy, your comments. Good evening. Well, first of all, I do want to thank uh, Mayor Brett Lee, as well as Anne and Catherine and Dima. Um, really for recognizing the role food plays in economic development in general. Um, and that they've achieved this via the Let's Talk About Food series and the preparation of this report. Food is a basic need, and its importance to our well-being is universally understood. So making the connection between food and typical economic development initiatives, such as industry and job creation, new business startups, branding and marketing, and highlighting the link to the academic and research capabilities that are readily accessible here in Davis, it's a brilliant way to engage a broad cross-section of the community in community and economic development conversations in the community. What I particularly applaud, however, is their willingness to embrace the concept of ensuring access to a healthy diet for all in the process and in this report. Not only does it provide acknowledgement that poverty and food insecurity indeed are significant challenges here in Davis. In fact, and as uh, Catherine noted, Davis has the highest rate of both poverty and food insecurity in Yolo County. Um, but also that food-based economic development cannot be successfully implemented, nor Davis as a community truly thrive without first addressing hunger and nutrition and how they relate to the health and wellness outcomes educational outcomes, employment and housing outcomes, and so many other measures of social mobility that impact the economy and the common good of all who reside in and do business in Davis. Furthermore, the inclusion of food insecurity in this report documents the need for civic and local government support for nonprofits such as Yolo Food Bank that are engaged in meeting the food security need of the county and of Davis. 
As Yolo County Chief Administrator Patrick Blacklock has stated publicly of Yolo Food Bank's critical role in the county social safety net, there is no other entity capable of providing these essential services and programs, he has said. Yolo Food Bank has a $10 million uh, annual impact upon the social safety net of the county, yet the vast majority of annual funding comes thanks to the generosity of individual donors in Davis and throughout the county, just average people like you and me. The action steps in this report set in motion plans to alter that current reality in a positive way. In a city with nearly 30% poverty that is home to a university campus with 44% student food insecurity, according to the recent uh, Student Food Security Task Force study, the issue absolutely needs to be considered at the city and university policy and planning levels. And while food waste uh, rescue and diversion efforts uh, can and do have an impact and are valued, there is no greater impact possible than that of sustainable funding for an entity such as Yolo Food Bank, an entity that sits at the hub of a network of growers, grocers, and other food donors, as well as nearly 200 distribution partners. And that includes 70 nonprofit organizations for whom food is critical to the execution of their own missions. Um, they obtain food, the food that they need, um, for free, actually, from Yolo Food Bank, uh, other than a nominal 19 cents per pound shared maintenance fee. So that has an incredible impact upon uh, their ability to be sustainable with their own budgets. Uh, these nonprofits include many serving Davis, such as Steak, Davis Community Meals and Housing, Communicare, Empower Yolo, Meals on Wheels Yolo County, and at UC Davis, the Pantry, the Aggie Compass Basic Needs Center, and the Solano Park Family Housing Neighborhood on campus. In fact, Solano Park is served via a very special collaboration with the Davis Farmers Market and Food Recovery Network at UC Davis. In total, there are 21 ongoing food distributions in the city of Davis, all propelled by Yolo Food Bank. And in fact, we're, uh, we're about two weeks away from moving into our new food distribution warehouse and operations facility in Woodland. And uh, with that, there's a potential for even more food distribution in the city of Davis. The absolute most immediately beneficial suggestions in this report are those to build in financial support via ordinances related to sales in the city of various products such as cannabis, as well as to explore collaborative grant opportunities both with Yolo Food Bank and with our network to enhance their capacity to fully embrace their partnerships with us and expand upon food innovation kitchen options in the city of Davis and throughout the county. As an agricultural institution, deepening UC Davis's engagement with the city and the food bank in research and innovative solutions to this challenge amidst agricultural bounty also carries merit as an approach to addressing the underlying causes of hunger in our midst. Similarly, encouraging healthy menu options amongst vendors of affordable food choices in Davis and working with the Davis Joint Unified School District to ensure free and reduced price meal participation are important initiatives. Also, finding the right way to extend Yolo Food Bank's popular Kids Farmers Market concept in the Davis School District also is a worthy goal. Through this interactive, engaging program, children obtain produce, learn about it, come to understand its monetary value, uh, receive nutritional facts, and experience the seed to plate journey of the food that they're obtaining and eating. Food insecurity is more than not enough food. It's not enough of the right foods, the foods that achieve and sustain good health. Davis is the ideal environment to combine economic development with other community attributes to create real innovation and impact that changes lives right here in Davis. I'm looking forward to working together with Davis community leaders toward this end. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, do we have any reaction here, Desmond? Uh, there's a here for, um, from Joy Cohen. It says, all that's missing is the structure to organize and focus the assets. So for the next iteration and iterations after that, it would be great if you have the time and resources to draw a map of the organizations that are now engaged with um, food distribution to the insecure, and perhaps describe briefly the various roles they play 
and some proposal as how the, how the coordination might work, the mechanism whereby these various agencies could be coordinated to have a smooth, smoother functioning distribution to the food insecure. The structure and organization and management of that process. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Dan. Desmond got to that quote before I did. Uh-oh. Go ahead. Because I had circled it as well. I have a question for you, not for you to answer out loud, but just to yourself. Within the last week, have you personally dealt with anybody who doesn't have enough to eat? My guess is, for most of us, probably not. And if you did, you did something about it. You probably asked them over, well, come on over. If you're in somebody that you knew, you said, well, come on over to my house. The will is there. Look at the people around the room. But this takes us back. I'm trying to take it to an emotional people level. But the structure, OK, how do I do something about that? I know I've had the experience. I go to a lot of farms to write my column. Uh, I've had the experience of going to a place that had rows and rows of tomatoes. It wasn't economical to pick them. And bringing boxes from the co-op and spending an afternoon picking them and bringing them to the Olo Food Bank. Um, because there's no structure, and I keep thinking, couldn't we just have a structure where people were so moved? I know university students and others would jump on that. Great, thanks. Katerina. Yeah, I just want to add, I was really excited to see that one of the first bullet points was to include food security in the city's updated policies and planning documents. And embedding that throughout the city's policy, I think, is going to be key. Um, I also uh, agree that uh, continued financial support for existing programs and new programs is is a great thing. <laughs> um, and then the other two things, I think, um, uh, yeah, I guess the other two things that I just want to mention is um, having, from what I understand with the students that I've spoken with, um, sometimes the issues are access to a kitchen, so community kitchens are amazing. Um, sometimes the issue is time and not having time to prepare a meal. So ready-made, low-cost, healthy options I think are going to be really important um, and identifying ways either through food recovery programs like the Food Recovery Network is doing um, throughout the city um, uh, could be great. And then the last thing I just want to mention um, uh, is uh, considering representation as um, the city moves forward with this specific topic and ensuring that the people who are in the room um, guiding uh, either the policy or the planning with, within the city actually represent the people who are most impacted by this. And um, often we know those are people who aren't necessarily the people sitting in this room right now. So um, just ensuring that there's representation uh, specifically, especially with this topic, I think is important. Great, thank you. I just want to say uh, welcome to all of you. If you want to take a seat, there's, there are plenty of seats. Do feel free. We'll just take a quick second, and you won't be disturbing the people if, if you wish. OK, then we're getting ready for priority action area number three, make Davis a leading center for food entrepreneurship and innovation. OK, thanks, Ann. So this action area is actually um, somewhat two-pronged. Um, it's, it's about embracing both the technical and science-based innovations around food and agriculture that are coming out of the university, but also embracing small-scale and creative food entrepreneurs that are innovating in their own ways. Much of the reason why we saw, this actually came up quite a lot in, in our, all our conversations, and I think one of the reasons why it came up so much is that we have such perfect assets. We have all the ingredients for this. Um, from UC Davis is the number one in the nation for agriculture with 15 departments in the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. We have 35 research centers and institutes focused on food systems and 7,000 plus UC Davis students enrolled in food-focused degree programs. And so we have a really great opportunity to keep that talent in this area, um, keep that pipeline that's coming out of the university if we can create a space for them or the incentives for them to stay and start their businesses, whether that's ag tech, food tech, or creative food businesses in this area. 
Um, in terms of ag tech and food tech, it is a very big growing space and definitely an economic space that we should be thinking about. So just last year, um, $10.1 billion was invested into agri-food tech solutions, many of them around sustainable ag and food solutions. Um, in addition to those, the assets I mentioned that are very valuable for those in the ag tech, food tech space, we have lots of great assets also for food entrepreneurs in the more creative food business space. Um, UC Davis's food science program, UCANR is a wonderful asset, UC Serap is another asset, um, and our proximity to farmland is a really um, perfect ingredient for entrepreneurs to be able to get local food to create their food um, options. And also, I think it could tie in very nicely to um, gleaning. And if you're a food entrepreneur, you may want to go out and glean and then use that produce to create interesting products. But one of the things that we, know, we noted is that we need to make it easier um, for people to enter the food economy. So entrepreneurs, um, to do that for entrepreneurs, we need to work on some of the policies around um, supporting home cooks and mobile vending uh, and other pathways that allow people to start businesses in food that is less capital intensive of going straight into the restaurant space. Um, and this would allow for a lot of people who are not able to currently uh, participate in the food economy to do so. That includes women, people of color, immigrant communities where that kind of capital may not be at their disposal. Um, and the, the last thing around sort of e the economics of this is that we know that food businesses also bring a lot of um, economic generation for the city. So when we looked at some numbers around downtown, and this was actually through our work on DPAC, uh, food and dining in the downtown area contributes 55% of downtown taxable sales. And that was in 2017, and that was up from 39% in 2008. So while we see some sectors in retail going downward, food is going up. People want to gather around food. Um, and so that's an area that the city could really invest in since it is an economic growth area. So I'm going to jump uh, into the action steps, and I am actually going to pass it off to, to, to Catherine in a little bit. But on the fostering a thriving business environment, some of the things we talked about was developing a grant program for foods. In some ways, we do that around arts. Let's do it around food as well. We want to um, invest in a support and ticketing system that, uh, that's online that makes it easier for food businesses to get all their permitting, because right now it requires a lot of going in to talk to staff. Um, we wanted to also have uh, focused economic development efforts on attracting developers who want to um, create commercial kitchen spaces, work on sort of innovation centers. Uh, also, interest in a culinary pathway program, I'm supposed to go faster, at, at DJUSD. Um, and then one last thing that I want to just quickly meant is um, providing more support for the home cook effort um, in Davis and, and work with Yolo County to, to push that through. All right, so I'm going to round that up by talking specifically about street food vending. Um, together with Councilman Lucas Frerichs, we authored an op-ed in 2016 about legalizing street food vending in Davis. Um, currently, um, you can operate, but you have to move every 10 minutes. Um, new state legislation happened in 2018, SB 946, and uh, that legislation um, states that uh, regulating street food vending can only be done for public health reasons, which means that the Davis, uh, the current ordinance that Davis has is not in compliance with state regulation and it needs to be changed. Um, and it would be a wonderful thing if it were changed because um, Davis is culturally diverse, we have an international population, and street food is often um, very much a part of, of a normal, normal meal planning um, for a lot of folks. In addition, um, Street food vending offers new business opportunities for existing brick and mortar. So um, Rajas Tandoori and Zuma Poke, who has provided food in the back, um, they both have pop-up stands at the food market. Um, in addition, uh, offering street food vending would increase tax revenues for the city. 
and it could supply students with lower cost healthy food options. So for all of these reasons, in addition to now this need to become compliant with state regulation, um, it's time for Davis to do something about its street food vending. So this is uh, a priority action area, which is something that council could act on immediately if they wanted to. And we have included um, in the back of this report about 20 pages worth of model municipal ordinance uh, pertaining to street food vending. Um, this ordinance um, was, it comes from Sacramento, but it was based off of a review of all of California's uh, 485 city street food vending ordinances and 58 county um, ordinances. So it's, it's, this would be, this is top of the line <laughs> if Davis wanted to adopt it. All right, thank you very much. And so uh, Andy Waterhouse is gonna give our comments on sustainability. Right. <clears throat> or entrepreneurship, sorry. Entrepreneurship, <laughs> yes. Uh, I want to echo the prior comments that I want to thank the organizers here for putting this together. Um, I remember when we first moved to, for me to work at the university, there, we had to make a decision where we were going to buy a house. And there were lower cost options <laughs> just down the road. And I remember my wife saying, well, we want to live in Davis because people care about it here. And I think this is an example of the community caring about um, its future. And I, I really um, want to commend all of you for being interested in working on this and, and coming here tonight. So I have some specific comments about um, action priority area number three. And I think I'm going to go back to Dima's comments on that this is really two um, areas. And in a way, I don't know whether you want to rewrite it enough to create two different areas, but I think there's sort of the retail restaurant innovation area. And, and in my mind, that's very different from sort of research-based food agritech innovation. So I don't know whether we want to consider that much of a change to the report, but um, I see those as very different spheres of activity, um, perhaps because I come from the university. Um, now, as far as the agri-food tech innovation, there's definitely opportunities, lots of opportunities to work with the university. In fact, I mean, you're well aware that we have the Food Loss and Waste Collaborative, and I'm sure that that Ned Spang is going to be very interested in working with any group in the city that, that wants to undertake this, uh, this effort. Um, <clears throat> but I think there's other areas where there can be really concrete collaborations uh, between uh, a group in the city and the university, although I have to admit that doesn't happen very often. Um, but you know, I can certainly help, uh, but the, the point is that um, there, there are lots of opportunities, and I think the university has not taken full advantage of that. We, we, there are something like 30 to 50 centers on campus that deal somewhat with food. There really isn't a center that deals with food innovation like being discussed here. Uh, there is at one food innovation center, but it really focuses on large food companies. And really, when we talk about the innovation we're talking about here, there's an opportunity there to get a group of faculty on campus to really take on a new initiative, uh, which, would, uh, which would change the landscape. Um, in addition, I think the, <clears throat> and this is really pushing the envelope on the university, because um, right now we have a food science program. It's very strong technically. We also have the Graduate School of Management, which is a great business school. We don't really have a food innovation program for students. And really, we want those kind of students to come into this sphere here in Davis. So that's a push. The university's slow to change in those ways. But um, I think that that would be very exciting to get some, uh, some change in that direction to get a degree program uh, focused, say, on food and food innovation. So, <clears throat> um, okay, so, so those are the three points I wanted to make. So I'll, I'll stop there. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Very, very, very interesting. Um, do we have some reaction to that? No? Desmond's passing. I'll, Katerina? I'll, I'll react. Um, you get Desmond's minute. Go ahead. Um, I, uh, I yield. <laughs> I, um, uh, I guess the two things I want to say, I was really excited to hear the emphasis on uh, um, uh, food vending. And um, I think there's a lot of different reasons that you expressed really nicely on why that would be really valuable for Davis and the surrounding community. Um, uh, I agree that there's a lot of more opportunities for UC Davis to um, partner with Davis, I think, around these topics. And then it's just one bullet point, but I'm just going to give a shout out to it. But the Davis Joint Unified School District Culinary Pathway Program, I thought that was a really neat idea um, and a really nice way to link into the community college system, potentially, and the greater region. So I just thought that was nice. I want to get pointed about something. Um, there's a mention of developing a grant program to help new creative food businesses get started. Those are businesses, and that gets touchy for government money to be involved there. Government easing the way with economic development and ordinances and such, and partnerships and innovation is, that's great, but if uh, what went through my mind is to the extent we're looking for money from the government uh, of Davis, I think of the people who are not in this room, and maybe some of you, who are in the same moment knowing about cutbacks in yard waste pickup and pothole pressures and all the rest of it. And so when we leave here with this energy, people like the mayor and members of the city council are hearing all of that as well. And I think to look to the city for financial support, um, if we're leaning that way, should be very careful in what we're trying to do to create businesses. Okay. I will yes. make a quick one at this point. I used to uh, read competitive grants for the United States Department of Agriculture, and they have a program called a Small Business Innovation Grant Program. I read probably 100 grant, grant proposals for that, for that program. And uh, it's a phase, then you apply for a phase one grant, and the phase two grant, then a commercialization grant. But you can, entrepreneurs can make proposals to the U.S. Department of Agriculture through that program. It's not guaranteed. Maybe you have a one in 50 shot of getting a grant, but that's Great. one opportunity. Thank you. All right, uh, so we'll move on to priority action area number four, establishing a cohesive food brand and narrative. And this is really the last, uh, section in between you and a little nice snack being provided and some get up and move around time. So hang in there. Uh, okay. Dima? Yeah. And so this is, uh, this is last, but also the, the shortest probably, um, at least from, from what I'll be saying. Um, so branding and narrative for the city of Davis came up quite a lot throughout of our, throughout all of our conversations. Um, there is definitely an opportunity for the city to, to consider investing in this space. Uh, we've seen that other cities are taking on food as a primary part of their branding, um, and that's drawing in tourism. Um, we actually, through the, the DPAC and looking at some of the downtown stats, um, our downtown is not bringing in people for, for tourism. It is primarily serving just the community that's here, but it could be an economic driver um, if we um, enabled a creative food businesses to be in the space, but also we had some branding and marketing to drive people um, to come and visit Davis for food. Uh, one thing that we learned during the process is that the Yolo Visitors Bureau is also doing some work on branding primarily for the whole the whole Yolo County um, in order to bring tourism to Yolo. And so we feel like Davis should have its own separate brand, but should probably tie into that overall brand for YOLO. Um, the action areas that, that we came up with were that we um, definitely need to create a brand narrative, but one of the key areas that we thought would be important is actually hiring a branding and marketing agency. So this is something that we learned that the uh, city of Woodland did do uh, for their Woodland Food Front project. Um, developing a tagline, something that everybody can just remember when they think about Davis. Um, and we did want to consider sustainable food and the 
maybe not necessarily the word sustainable, but that being something that would go through the brand narrative. One other thing that came up actually quite a lot was designing a billboard um, and having a billboard on the I-80. So we, we have 150,000 daily, daily travelers on the I-80. We do have other cities near us who do have billboards. So this could be a really good opportunity once we have that brand and narrative to actually attract those people coming through on the I-80. And one other thing that came up is um, attracting food entrepreneurs and restaurants through sort of not necessarily an, a large outreach, but trying to attract entrepreneurs and restaurants and establishing Davis as a food-friendly town, so a food-friendly business town. So um, one idea there is to put some of the economic development and giving incentives or, or working to bring in and, cre and support creative and innovative food businesses so that then our brand is telling a story that aligns with what we're offering. And then lastly, an area that also came up quite a bit was having world-class events. Um, a nice event that has been brought up, and you guys are probably learning about it um, uh, later today, um, Dustin over there in the back is working on a rice festival. This could be a signature event that the city could perhaps support um, that would really draw people in, um, and, and rice makes a lot of sense for our region. Um, it could also celebrate a lot of the international community that we have here, um, since rice is such a significant part of many people's diets. So that was, um, we, we talked about perhaps the city sort of focusing on some signature events, even putting up an RFP for people to submit s some of these large signature events and supporting things like the Rice Festival. We also thought a small grants program for creative food programming could be another avenue, not necessarily at the scale of a large international festival, but even smaller food events that could, could gather people. And lastly, um, there was, this came up actually from the very beginning to the end was the city designating a food event venue, a space where you could demo good food, sustainable food practices, where you could do education, uh, where you could bring in creative businesses. Um, and that could be either a, a city-owned space or a space that the city would help support to bring about. And that is it. Okay, great. Thank you, Dima. And Lauren Kaliski is going to give us more remarks on this. Lauren? Thank you. So uh, just as everybody else did, I'm going to also thank the organizers, um, Dima and Catherine and Anne and Grace. Uh, this is a, f a fabulous uh, a series of discussions and a fabulous initiative. And um, I'm really thrilled to be having this conversation in Davis now. I think that uh, uh, it's, it's about time. <laughs> um, it's kind of been my soapbox issue for, for the, the past several years. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about branding and give my reactions. Uh, so first, I actually want to talk about myself, because branding is about identity. And uh, my identity, I feel, somehow parallels that of Davis a little bit. Um, Many of you know my story a little bit just because my mother, who is the bread lady at the Davis Farmer's Market, uh, likes to talk about her children and uh, <laughs> likes to talk in general. Um, <laughs> uh, but I grew up in Davis. Um, I, I moved away when I was 18 and, and lived away for, for most of my adult life. I uh, went to college in Boston and then uh, lived in Paris for a number of years. Uh, I worked in marketing and technology and uh, in entrepreneurship. I lived in San Francisco uh, also for a number of years and then moved back to Paris. I lived in Paris for a, a grand total of about 14 years. And then in 2013, I came back to California with my family, my wife and kids, and moved to Berkeley for a couple years, and then Davis in 2015. Um, and Around that time was when things were really starting to take off with this region in terms of food branding. I mean, we had uh, the most amazing branding campaign uh, I've seen around food in Sacramento uh, with what they've done branding themselves as America's farm to fork capital. That 
branding campaign has really captured the imagination of people uh, in Sacramento and throughout the region, and it's been a tremendous success. Um, and the food front uh, campaign as well in, in Woodland is, is uh, another successful uh, uh, example. Um, so I came back to Davis, I got involved with my family's business, um, and when I came back to Davis, Davis was really a very different place from when I had left it. When I was a kid, uh, Davis was really kind of a sleepy small town, um, and today we're really a, a bustling little city. Uh, we have parking problems, and we have housing shortages, and we have some homelessness, and we've got some crime, and we've got a little bit of grit now. So that's uh, interesting and different. Um, it's not all bad. Uh, we've got a pretty vibrant downtown, I feel, in a lot of ways, um, with a lot of uh, locally owned businesses. Um, we've got great schools. We've got uh, some first-rate cultural venues like the Mandavi Center and the, the Shrem Museum. Um, and Davis has changed a lot. It's, it's quite obvious. Uh, I, I don't want to leave like I did when I was 17 and 18. Um, but what's important about the identity of Davis, I think, is what's really kind of remained the same over the past 30 uh, years of... of uh, well, more than that of my experience, but th I was gone for, for uh, 30 years before coming back. Um, and, and that identity of, of Davis, you know, understanding who we are uh, and what's remained the same. Um, so, you know, branding is all about this idea of identity. It's about competitive differentiation. You know, branding is, is something that dates back to um, the Egyptians, actually, uh, according to Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> livestock branding, uh, the, the Egyptians started that to uh, uh, identify the animal's owner and differentiate livestock, um, and that's a practice that continues today. Um, in the context of business, branding is also about identity and competitive differentiation. It's, un it's about understanding who you are, uh, defining who you want to be, it's about telling a story. Um, and in business, it matters because you're trying to sell something, right? And in the context of what we're talking about today, we're talking about economic development in Davis, food and economic development. So we're really trying to sell Davis as a, uh, a food uh, place. Um, so, you know, what hasn't changed much in the past 30 years, Davis is still a very proudly quirky city. We believe in things like bikes and solar homes and toad tunnels, and uh, we've got diverse perspectives and strong opinions and uh, all kinds of things like that. The problem with branding in Davis uh, is also that. It's that uh, those strong opinions and the fact that economic development itself is often a contested issue. So uh, if you're against economic development or specific economic development initiatives, it's hard to get behind a branding effort to differentiate yourself from the competition and sell what you might have to sell, because you probably don't care. Um, but a well-done branding campaign can really transcend that. And I would say that uh, what we need in Davis um, is a branding campaign that really does transcend the issues that we're discussing here today, because as Davis, and I think we'll all agree that, that growth and economic development are inevitable, whether it comes from food or, or anything else, um, and a branding campaign is gonna help us control and maintain that identity as we grow, as, as, uh, as Davis develops. Um, so I think there's lots of great ideas uh, and action steps, specific action steps in the, in the branding section of this report. I, I agree we need to attract more food entrepreneurs. I think a billboard on the highway is a great idea. I think the Rice Festival is going to be our world-class event, uh, and I'm super excited about that. Um, but the most important action step for me is really hiring a branding agency because I think that that's going to help us articulate and maintain who we are. It's going to help us uh, maintain our culture and our values as we grow as a city. Um, that's Great. what I have to say. Thank you very, very much. Uh, some reactions? 
Dan's passing, Desmond? Yeah, um, I'm sure I'm in the minority, but I lean towards um, a county brand, Yolo County, uh, some kind of where we spread the opportunities and the costs and the management and all of that, taste of Yolo or something like that, and it would embrace uh, woodland and winters and um, all the other parts of the of the county. We've, we're often viewed as an isolationist kind of city, elitist. And if you take the rice festival you're doing, we don't grow rice in Davis. Laugh. We don't grow rice in Davis. We don't go hard at anything here. We grow it in Yolo County. Um, apricots, um, almonds, and walnuts, and the like. Tomatoes we used to grow. We used to even grow um, sugar beets. So I think I particularly am biased more towards a, a county type brand. The people who sell at your market, uh, Randy, they're, they're from all over. The other thing I want to leave with is if you could get some notion of the kind of resources that these plans would take, at least the ones you prioritize, the personnel that it might entail, the organizational support, and then the money. You have to pay staff, and all these grants we're talking about, all those grants cost money. So um, if the city adopts this, then the city has to figure out what it can afford, and what it will take in terms of directing, redirecting personnel, and how much they want to put up for the grants, and so forth and so on, where they get that money. So there's nowhere in the project proposal here that it speaks to resources. It's a good aspirational document, it's a great big vision, but everything costs money. I think Dan mentioned it earlier. And if you're not um, Mr. Trump, who just can spend, you know, trillion dollar tax cut here and there, it's not real money. But it will be real money locally. So resources and what the different, what will a big festival cost? Who will manage it? Who will direct it? What about the advertising for it? What about people who will direct the traffic and all that? They all cost, so. Okay, good points, thank you. Katrina? Um, I think the only point I was gonna make, and maybe if a good marketing agent was hired, it would happen, maybe it wouldn't happen, maybe it wouldn't happen but just making sure that if, um, with the branding direction, just to make sure it's, it really um, captures what's happening as opposed to what we wish were happening. Um, so that's my one comment about that. In Sacramento, if I may add, the fame that they've achieved with their brand that originated with two chefs and with the Convention and Visitor Bureau, one of the people there. That was the driving energy, those three people. And they went to the scale of having connections to the White House. Uh, a gentleman, his last name I forget, but his name is Sam, um, on Obama's staff even came out here and had a dinner and talked about it. So they, they got these blessings on your endeavor. I wonder if we couldn't get those sorts of things, at least at the state level. But as a final asterisk, what we don't have here are the corporate sources. There's a lot of places you could go to. You could go to Roseville, for example, and if you were doing something like this, the way that city functions, you could bring corporate money to the table. But we don't have the corporations here that are headquartered or have a history of getting involved in that manner. Right, important uh, to note. Okay, so that wraps up our four areas, and I want to thank the panel. They'll be back right after we take a break. Um, just quickly, where do we go from here? Um, we're going to be making any changes due to these questions that you will have, and get your cards ready, and please leave them on these, this table before you go get some food. Um, we'll be getting that report into Diane Paro March 22nd. S no? Yes, we will. <laughs> um, and, and so that's so that it can come up, uh, you know, during the April budget negotiations for the council and so on. But the council and Diane will determine what the timing is on how they discuss it and so on. Um, and then uh, I want to just review quickly what the priority action items are. Yes, for 2019, Dima has it up there. Um, and leave, leave us with this. Um, 
So we would, we would hope that in 2019, there's 10 more months, um, that we can bring City of Davis into compliance with the street vending, uh, food vending ordinance to establish a working relationship with some sort of organization that acts as some sort of um, uh, food policy council or something of that nature. And to, to really take a look at the, realistically at branding, if we can get going with that. Uh, and then explore investment and in zoning for food and agriculture uh, innovation and entrepreneurship center to be located in Davis. There's that, that idea has come up consistently throughout the report, whether it's co-located with a farmer's market or in some other area, but really a center <coughs> uh, for food. And then finally, um, well, that, the exploring the Good Food Center. So um, uh, January 2020, we've asked <coughs> that the council take a look at whether or not they'd be willing to hold a public forum on how far they've come in those 10 months. Um, and I'll leave it with that. You're free to enjoy some food brought to us by several different uh, local businesses. Take 15 minutes or so, and then we'll reconvene here. Okay, we're gonna start the question and answer period now. Kind of the driver on the Small Business Innovation Research Program out of the Small Business Administration. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna start the question and answer period now. Um, we have a lot of questions. Um, we're going to go to 9.20. Uh, there's going to be a lot of questions uh, that we can't answer uh, tonight. And we're going to take the questions that are uh, uh, the remaining questions and put them up on Civ Energy. And we're going to hope that uh, the panel will be answering the questions on the internet. So you could go to Civ Energy in a couple of days, and hopefully all the answers will be up. So. Um, each person will have uh, two minutes to respond to the question. Right, or one. I mean, just do, you know, I think we want to respond, but, you know, keep it brief. But whoever would like to respond is fine. So more than 50% of our households are in multifamily housing. What does the report say about community gardens uh, requiring space for people to be able to grow their own food? Or what should it say about that? Um, I, I can take that. Well, we do have it in the, the establishing um, uh, Davis as a sustainable food city, um, and, and that's also part of um, the downtown plan in terms of edible landscaping, um, but augmenting community gardens and connecting them with the rest of the food infrastructure, including food access and micro-entrepreneurs is, is part of the picture. Um, it could be built out further, so we welcome you uh, to sign up, whoever gave that comment, and, and provide some other ideas that you think ought to be in the, the final version of the report. Okay, anybody else? No, so Central Park is arguably the most underutilized resource in the city, but the downtown plan is looking to de-emphasize it even more. Shouldn't this be reversed and Central Park used more? Anybody's welcome to comment. Yes. <laughs> Take it again. Um, the, um, we, one of the things that emerged during the conversation was the bike museum as a space that is loved as a piece of our, our city's identity, but maybe isn't visited that often unless you need to use its very well-kept bathrooms. Um, and so that, that kept being floated as a space that could be turned into a public kitchen, a food entrepreneur, entrepreneurial space. Um, and that, that very much builds on um, the thriving farmer's market on Wednesdays and Saturdays, which is the heart of the city of, of Davis and has been acknowledged as the, as the heart in the, in the downtown plan as well. So I don't think we're de-emphasizing Central Park in this. I don't think that was the... Um, so I think the goal. comment specifically said that the downtown plan was de-emphasizing the farmer's right. market. And I, uh, I am on the DPAC. I, I'm, I would love to well, talk... Well, the Central Park, not, not farmer's market. Sorry, the Central Park. Uh, I, I actually... We were presented with two um, different plans just in our very last meeting. Uh, and I think that there's still quite a lot of discussion about what that plan looked like. And one of the things that did come up was that Central Park 
ought it, for some, some who commented, should be more of uh, a, a spot where we would see uh, more activity. Um, I definitely think that in the comments that came during the, a lot of the DPAC discussions, Central, Par Central Park and the farmer's market came up as a, a centerpiece for the city. I think it was very much brought up as an important place to, to center around. So it would be good to, um, whoever wrote that comment, I'd love to talk to you afterwards to understand sort of why you thought that. Okay, what specific strategies for growing money for school food related programs into more effective, comprehensive education for families? RISE, which is the recycling is simply elementary, composting, school gardens, and farm to school. Any suggestions? Do you want to talk at all about how the school district is mentioned in the report? or? Well, so one of the things that was brought up, um, I don't know that it covers everything that was in that question, but um, one of the things we did talk about was a culinary pathway program. Um, and I think that could be a very interesting program for DGA USD to support. Um, Davis Farm to School has already been working in, in this space with the co-op to try and do some education in the younger grades. But really, that should be a holistic program that goes all the way through high school and then could go into community colleges or into UC Davis or, or other universities. Um, so hopefully, that addresses part of that. Okay. What is the mechanism for the Food Policy Council to engage with the existing retail food economy, i.e. grocery, restaurant, and value-added vendors? And uh, in the comments of the report, it has very little to say about local agriculture. What role do or should local food producers play here? So the first part is, what's the mechanism for the Food Policy Council to engage with the existing food economy? In other words, how will maybe representatives from grocery stores, restaurants, and value-added vendors be brought into the Food Policy Council? Um, we had representation from grocery stores, vendors, food retail as part of the process. Um, initially, and I think we would want to continue that going forward. The, the process benefited a lot from having, um, uh, you know, the, the, the owners of Nugget involved, the owners of small businesses, the owners of new businesses. I think in the, um, in the research on food policy councils, so this is a 2018 study by Johns Hopkins that looked at 341 food policy councils. About 71% of them operate at the local level, the city level. And the most common format is a nonprofit. So even though the food policy council itself is a nonprofit, it often has board representatives from industry partners, from commercial partners, who can help with these public-private um, sponsorships for events, uh, which I think is going to be crucial to, to moving a lot of um, things around because, as Desmond had pointed out, um, uh, we can't over-rely on the city for funding. Um, it has to, the, the, the effort has to sustain itself moving forward. Right. Did you want to comment on that at all, Lauren, as a local business person who was involved? I could say that um, from uh, my perspective, um, the the, the two things that come to mind that have been the most um, influential uh, to our business in terms of, of uh, progressive food policy, if you will, were had nothing to do with the with 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 government or the city of Davis. It had to do with um, working with KP Organic and Farm Fresh to You and having to go through all of our ingredients and audit the sourcing of ingredients and then wanting to have a booth at the Whole Earth Festival and having to uh, take a close look at our packaging and, um, and uh, rethink a lot of the packaging uh, to, to do away with plastic. Okay, great. So, so Anne, can I just make yeah. one other comment? No, um, so one thing that I do think that a food policy council can help with is a little bit along the lines of what Katie was saying, was making these connections and synergies happen. So if we're working on trying to get more entrepreneurs to do interesting things with food waste and create value-added products, working with re our, our grocery stores to create programs where they're actually uh, giving them shelf space because they're local products coming from our area, perhaps through programs around 
using food waste. Um, I think that that is uh, that could be very valuable if the organization were to just help make those connections happen so that you see those kind of products actually showing up in these grocery stores. Right. Great. Desmond? Yeah, that's kind of what I was going to say, that we should recognize <clears throat> and highlight uh, and lift up the word you use. Um, places like the Davis Food Cooperative and the Nugget Market, because they have really developed and, and grown um, value-added products and, and other products using fresh produce from our local area. And they're pioneers, innovators in this, in this uh, city, and we should not dismiss them in favor of new people. Right, and so along those lines, there's a question, how about getting Nugget behind this as a corporate sponsor? And Nugget was involved in the, in the discussions. Does, did you want to comment on that at all? Well, Nugget and Co-op were both very involved. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are some of the implications for growth and economic productivity of legalizing home-based cooks in Davis? Can you read it one more time? Yeah. So this is about home-based cooks, and there's new legislation around home-based cooks, and we know that that's sort of a county area, and we're in the report asking for the city to work with the county to help make that extra yep. possible. What are some of the implications for growth and economic productivity of legalizing this? In other words, how will home-based cooks, if there are more of them, and they're, it is legal, how are they going to contribute to growth and economic productivity? And it's open to anybody. Oh, good. Go, Andy. Well, I, I think an important point is if you're trying to uh, improve food access um, that home-based cooks actually generally have fairly affordable prices mm -hmm. um, and it also allows folks who don't have a large amount of uh, resources to invest actually start to get into the economy so I think it opens doors in terms of allowing um, a, a different group of folks to actually participate in the economy. So I, I think it's very important from that perspective. And I'll, I'll add also that there, there have been some entrepreneurial, um, there's some, some startups, there was a startup, and I forget the name, in, in Sacramento uh, that I'm not sure lasted very long, but, um, you know, uh, liberalizing a little bit the, the home-based cook uh, uh, laws uh, and making it easier for people to do that um, will open the door for things like the Airbnb for food, you know, uh, where people uh, can, or, or the Uber for food, if you will, where it's kind of a collaborative economy thing and, and people uh, could potentially create these marketplaces of uh, and, and make a living or make, uh, uh, augment their living from, from that type of business. Little pop-up restaurants all around. For example. So along those lines, will the city of Davis express its support for AB 626, the Micro Enterprise Home Kitchens Act? So we might want to include that in the report in some way. Uh, so it actually is in the report that we would like the city to support it. Mm -hmm. um, and if uh, it actually comes down to the county. Yeah. Um, so if it's a financial burden or if there's other hurdles, we would like at least the city and, and also this um, Food Policy Council to uh, figure out ways to get past those hurdles. And okay. before, you, before you ask the next sure, question, yeah, there you? was a question that was asked but didn't really get yeah, answered. Yeah, let me get the back of that. Right. Was, I think so, it was basically like, how does agriculture, the surrounding... The port has very little to say about local agriculture. What role should our local food producers play here? Thank you. Yeah, and I was going to pass it, because I'm sure this came up in some of the discussions, and I was wondering if, if you could speak to that a little bit. Um, so some, some of the local producers wanted to sell their items from a, you know, from a truck or something like that, and that's currently not possible. So it would support our smaller scale local producers if we um, legalized street food vending. Um, but we also... I mean, we were really inspired, a lot of people were really inspired by uh, Paula Daniels and the Institutional Purchasing Program, which would allow the city or the 
you know, or encourage um, the school district more broadly. And I know the university currently has programs like this right now to say, you know, anytime we have a catering event, we're going to source from you know, local farms, from, from local restaurants, but not from, not from larger chains. And that creates this feedback cycle. So we have Shermaine Hardesty, who's in the audience right now, who studies um, local, local farm communities and, and um, these direct marketing effects and how those add I don't want to get it wrong, Shermaine. What, but did you? So through opening up other forms of direct marketing, through street food vending, um, and also uh, supporting uh, public purchasing agreements, this would this would help help that that local economic ripple effect churn in in Davis and the county more broadly. And I, I'll also add that it, it, it's encouraging uh, local restaurants to buy produce from the farmer's market, from vendors at the farmer's market, and from local farms. Um, this is uh, something that happens. You know, we go to the uh, Central Sacramento Farmer's Market under the highway at X Street every Sunday, and there's a lot of Sacramento restaurants that will buy their produce at the Farmer's Market. You see chefs walking around there all the time, and that doesn't happen in Davis because I don't know why. There's restaurateurs are, are not necessarily doing that as much. Um, and then there's another interesting initiative um, in Marin. The Agricultural Institute of Marin has partnered with a, uh, a company uh, it does an app called What's Good that's connecting uh, vendors at their markets to uh, not just retail consumers, but uh, but wholesale buyers at restaurants and, and other types of uh, uh, organizations. Okay, so here's one on food security. It says, why is food security not a priority? Should be a number one priority. What is more important? I just want to say that the one, two, three, and four are not in, in order of importance, but maybe do, does anybody else want to expand on that? The, the four are meant to mutually support one another. Well, yeah, I, I never interpreted that as it was the second priority. Um, I assumed it was number one, but I mean, it was just me. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, um, I do think all of these priorities do work in tandem with one another. Um, obviously, there was a lot about um, uh, food uh, waste reduction and, and diversion that um, connects very closely with um, the interests that we have. Anything involving the agricultural community obviously has a great relationship to what we, what we do. Um, I will take just a moment to clarify something that came up um, in the reactions about um, structure. So I wanted to be really clear. We have a structure right now that produces 21 food distributions um, throughout Davis on an ongoing basis. The structure that I was referring to and that I think this report can hopefully help spark is um, the kind of structure that really addresses some of the underlying causes for food insecurity here in uh, Davis and, uh, and on campus. And, um, you know, getting to to uh, the the various the research, the intellect, and then yes, the physical capabilities that that an entity like the food bank brings. How to bring those together to to um, create the structure that gets down to the bottom of the issues. Okay, why don't we take one last question? Can I just a follow up? Sure, to that? please. Uh -huh. I mean, is it is it possible to just change the order of the first two? Yeah. Sure, be cool. possible. Uh, it's a draft, This so is yes. addressed to Catherine and Andrew, although I still think we should have a comment that they're not in order of priority. Um, how can we build better formal partnerships between UC Davis administration and the city to build steps for food waste and composting, as well as education and sustainability and carbon neutrality, and bring 
uh, and long-term planning. So how can we build that better formal partnership between UC Davis administration and the city in these areas? So anybody can answer, but it's addressed to Andy and Catherine. I'm just an assistant professor who doesn't yet have tenure, so I'm going to give this to Andy. <laughs> So glad. Um, well, we don't have enough time this evening to go over the intricacies <laughs> of. Um, suffice it to say, if if we have uh, advocates on both sides, we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, it is unusual to have these kinds of collaborations, and I mentioned that in my comments. So it's not we don't have a template for that. So it it, it won't be just a slam dunk but you know where there's a will there's a way and and i think um there's certainly an interest uh if we look at at, at uh, the existing food loss and waste collaborative I, I think there's lots of different um research projects going on and and many of the students involved i'm sure would be thrilled to work with a partner in davis so i it can happen so um, I just wanted to address that one of the things that we put in the report was actually um, very much related to connecting what's happening on the campus with the city and treating the city like a sustainable food lab where the city could even put out a competition um, where students get to have an internship working on programs around food waste and recovery. I think there's such an opportunity for that that could, you know, just calling it a competition or calling it a program where all the great work and research that's happening in food waste, especially with the Food Waste Collaborative, would bleed into the city um, as a sort of a more formal program. Okay, well, I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank you all for being here. Um, thanks to Mayor Brett Lee, who, who had to leave, but uh, Gloria Partita was here also uh, for attending. Um, the food was provided by KP Organic, Upper Crust Bakery, Davis Food Co-op, and Zuma Poke and Lush Ice. Delicious, and the Cali Rice Fest team has a little party favor for you as you leave, I think, on your way out. Um, so you stay up to date with the report's progress. Uh, there were about seven questions and comments that didn't get addressed. Uh, they will go on the website, Civ Energy website, um, and be addressed. Other questions can be addressed to that website, um, but please stay tuned there. Um, and I want to thank the City of Davis really for providing this space to Civ Energy, Davis Media Alliance for really making it possible, um, and to our panelists. Thank you all. I think Bob might have closing remarks. Bob, do you? No, I just have one, which is uh, you, uh, to, to get to the report, you could go to this, uh, to this uh, URL, <laughs> this web address, uh, and there, there are also the summary of uh, the previous discussions on, on that. Okay, all right, thank you all very, very much for being here. Appreciate it. <laughs>